introduce the uh, uh, topic, and then uh, and I'll, as well as the speaker, and maybe uh, um, Stefano can say a little bit about his background before we start talking to. So um, the, there's this. Is there another room? No, no. Uh, the, actually, you don't need to pay attention to that. Okay. <laughs> Distraction. Don't worry about that. Um, so there's a this whole uh, area of structural biology where we're trying to uh, understand better how molecules function based on their shape. Okay, uh, knowing what their three-dimensional structure is, and you know that um, um, molecules like proteins have a primary sequence of amino acids. Uh, those amino acids can fold into certain secondary sequences like alpha helices, beta pleated sheets, and then there's tertiary structure, which really gives a molecule its three-dimensional shape. And it's believed that certain molecules like enzymes, uh, certain compounds like enzymes, their their ability to function is based on how what kind of shape they have. So, so understanding the structure of a biomolecule is a very big area. But the problem is that uh, in order to to calculate or look at the the structure, you either need some very fancy microscope to do direct imaging, or you have to calculate its structure theoretically. Okay, and uh, neither side has been very satisfactory. First of all, uh, from a computational side, to calculate the structure, the 3D structure of a molecule, I mean, if it's if it's anything more than just a few atoms long, it's it's uh, almost impossible to calculate. And the problem with imaging has always been that, well, it's very small. How do you get a good resolution image of, uh, of a single molecule? Right? Um, there have been techniques that have been employed in the past. Uh, electron microscopy can be used to look at certain really big macromolecules like DNA. Um, but for other ones that are that are smaller than that, electron microscopy doesn't help either. So you, you resort to something like X-ray crystallography. Okay. Um, X-ray crystallography has been very satisfactory. It produces very high resolution data in images. The problem has always been that, uh, and maybe this is starting to get into what Ste Stefan is going to say, uh, but basically, the problem with crystallography is that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily reflect the native structure of a molecule because what you've taken is a, a molecule purified it to a point that you can crystallize it. And by the time the molecule is crystallizable, it no longer, ha no longer has the 3D structure that it has in normal living biology. Okay. So what inferences can you make from that um, in terms of how a molecule actually behaves in real life? We don't know. So there's always been a challenge, how do you Im image uh, living biomolecules? Okay, not necessarily molecules that you can crystallize. And so that gets into this, okay, X-ray diffraction imaging of, of, uh, of biomolecules. And so for this, uh, it's gonna be uh, Stefan Marchesini who's going to talk from the YouTuber. Hi, okay. uh, so I'm Stefan Marchesini uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, I used to work at uh, first in First in France at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, uh, and then at uh, Livermore, and well, then at Berkeley, Livermore, and then back to Berkeley. Uh, so I work uh, with these big machines that generate hi high power uh, X ray beams, uh, sometimes with a pre electron laser. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we would like to do is exactly what uh, Frank has uh, explained. Uh, so image single biological molecule, um, but also in general to develop uh, X-ray microscopy techniques to image uh, structures at very high resolution from uh, uh, single molecules uh, to um, uh, even entire living cells uh, and see, for example, where the macromolecules are in the, uh, the cell to understand the uh, function of the uh, so, uh, so uh, let me go to the what we're trying to do. So, what we would like to do for the uh, ultimate imaging tool, uh, we would like to have a microscope that generates a high resolution uh, image, uh, possibly atomic resolution. Um, it had, uh, it want it to be fast in order to be able to see uh, transitions, electronic transitions, chemical reactions, and things like that. Uh, we would like to have uh, depth information and penetration through materials so that we can get a three-dimensional structure. Uh, if you all, uh, the, one of the main advantages of X-rays is that they penetrate through material, so you can do three-dimensional image. Uh, another advantage 
of X-rays is that they give you a spectral contrast. If you go at a certain uh, absorption edge, if you go above a certain absorption of a given material, you can distinguish it from uh, another material based on the absorption coefficient that you measure. Uh, so you can get elemental, chemical, and magnetic sensitivity with the X-rays. Uh, we would like to have three dimensions, possibly or even uh, time resolution. Uh, we would like, it would, ideally, you want one of the limitations of microscopy is always the field of view. You can only image so many pixels, uh, depending on your camera, for example, and uh, non-destructive. Now. If you try to achieve all these at the same time, it's almost impossible. Uh, in particular, non-destructive and high resolution don't go well together. If you want to have very high resolution, you're going to damage your sample. Uh, you're you going to uh, give uh, energy is going to be deposited on the sample, and this is going to uh, create damage on the sample. It's going to break uh, break the chemical bonds, and the sample will. Uh, fall apart. The current techniques that exist, uh, there is uh, electron microscopy uh, that can give you very high resolution, can give atomic resolution. Uh, you can make very good lenses for electron microscopes, but they have several of these advantages. One is that it's slow, and two is that there is not much penetration, so you can't uh, look at thick objects. Uh, some advantages are that the cross-section is very uh, strong, so the uh, brightness of the image uh, is quite good. Uh, light mi microscopes <coughs> with visible light, uh, they, have, they are good, they can be fast, they are off the shelf, uh, but they are limited in resolution by the wavelength. Uh, the resolution of a microscope, uh, even if you build the biggest possible lens, is always limited by the half of the wavelength at, at best. Uh, then you can do scanning, micro, uh, scanning probes like a, a tunneling, scanning tunneling microscope or magnetic uh, force microscope or atomic force microscope and that they give you very high resolution of two dimensional surfaces they are good for material science and surface analysis but not so good for uh, biological applications uh, then there is X-ray microscopy uh, X-ray microscopy what, so the advantage of X-rays is that they go through materials, uh, and they are not affected very much by materials. And this makes um, making a lens for X-rays uh, quite difficult. Uh, so you can make lenses; they do exist, uh, but uh, they are not very efficient. And on top of that, uh, there is always in any microscope there is a depth of field limitation. The microscope is only in focus over a limited uh, distance. And uh, if you want to achieve very high resolution, you're going to be limited by the depth of field. Uh, then there is uh, crystallography, of course, as uh, was mentioned before. But there are two problems. One is uh, the conformation of the uh, protein that you're trying to look may change as you try to crystallize it. Uh, but second, uh, the in order to get a crystal from a protein, it may take years of work. If you have a membrane protein, for example, it's very difficult to crystallize, and people have spent uh, uh, 10 years to uh, crystallize some of these uh, membrane proteins, and there are very few that have been um, uh, imaged by uh, X-ray crystallography. So what are the um, reasons why we... Uh, like x-rays, we use x-rays. Uh, as I said, first of all, x-rays go penetrate uh, through materials. In particular, they scatter up weakly, and so you can approximate this, the interaction with your sample uh, as a single scattering. One x-ray is coming, and it bounces off one atom. It doesn't bounce twice because the uh, efficiency of, bounce, of scattering off each atom is very low. So the efficiency of scattering uh, twice is extremely low. Uh, the sh they have short wavelength, which uh, avoids the limitation of visible light microscopy. Uh, so the resolution is not limited by the wavelength anymore, or at least uh, up to a point. 
they have an important contrast mechanism uh, depending on the absorption of a given material um, if you have uh, say carbon you can go at the carbon edge uh, and the carbon will absorb more than another atom and so you can distinguish carbon from another atom uh, the interaction uh, is a scalar interaction so you can treat it like an, uh, a particle with no polarization uh, polarization effects are not very important. So uh, this makes the calculation or uh, the simulation of the experiments more uh, simpler. The disadvantages are that X-rays are difficult to manipulate, so it's difficult to uh, make optics that are good enough to achieve atomic resolution or even 10 nanometer resolution. Uh, currently, X-ray lenses are capable of about uh, 35 nanometer resolution. The scalar interaction, that's a pro or a con? Uh, well, it's a, you can, it's a, an advantage because uh, it makes the calculation easier. But if you, if you, you if you go into special cases at some resonance, uh, then you, you can get uh, non-scalar interaction due, uh, like a polarization effects due to like magnetic contrast. So you have to go in a special uh, configuration, experimental configuration to be able to see this. But in imaging, we don't really want it because it makes everything more complicated. Um, and so one of the solutions that we are working on instead of fabricating a microscope with a lens is to just measure you heat the sample with x-rays, you measure the scattered x-rays with a two-dimensional detector and you just calculate or try to invert the diffraction pattern uh, based on the measurement. Uh, and I'm um, repeating a little bit. Uh, so in x-ray microscopy, this is an image obtained at the x-ray microscope at the advanced light source. Uh, in Berkeley, at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley lab, there's a uh, synchrotron radiation uh, accelerator that generates powerful X-rays. Uh, then there is a lens that images uh, a biological cell. You you uh, rotate the cell to do a tomographic image, and you can get recover a three-dimensional structure of the cell. You can start begin to see some structures inside the cell. Um, but the resolution is roughly uh, of the order of 50 nanometer, and uh, it's the, the big one of the big goals of in this area is to uh, identify macromolecules, and uh, for that you need roughly 10 nanometer or less, five nanometer. Uh, I have a question about the lens. What, type of, what kind of lens is that that can still bend the light? It's uh, it's a Fresnel, it's called the Fresnel zone plate. Uh, so you approximate the phase shift that um, a lens generates by discrete steps. And, and you do that, so you do grooves, concentric grooves of uh, material that creates a phase shift. Um, so the difficulty is in if you want to make atomic resolution lenses, you have to fabricate atomic resolution, uh, have a precision of atomic resolution. X-ray microscopy, what's the principle behind image contrast? Uh, absorption. Absorption and, uh, uh, yeah, primarily absorption. You can go out of focus a little bit and you get uh, phase contrast. So has this been done? Been done, or yes. It's also a technique that's been developed. Yeah, yeah. It's a technique. Uh, it's actually there's a National Center for X-ray uh, Microscopy at Berkeley that uh, started last year to produce uh, uh, large quantities of data. And so they look at biology, like cells. Cells, yes. They do kind of survey of cells. Okay. So what we are trying to do instead. Is more is simpler. Uh, you have uh, X-rays now. In our case, we use uh, coherent X-rays. So you have a plane 
wave uh, as opposed to in incoherent light you have light coming from all directions in our case we have only one direction monochromatic uh, beam it goes through the sample and diffracts on the CCD uh, this is what we call diffractive imaging uh, the main problem is that in, normally here you put a lens and you image your uh, your sample with a detector uh, in our case we replace the lens with a computer so we, from the diffraction pattern we try to recover what the object looked like uh, based on the diffraction pattern and typically uh, we collect uh, a diffraction pattern of a thousand by a thousand pixels and then rotate the sample to do tomography and you end up with a large number of equations to solve and this is uh, uh, this inversion problem is of, uh, can be referred to as a phase retrieval problem. Uh, so the questions are, uh, can we really do it? Can, as what I'm going to show you is, uh, can we image object without lenses just based on the computational methods? Uh, and then, uh, can we even image something as small as 10 nanometers uh, using X-rays? <coughs> Uh, one problem is that x-rays also damage your sample so as you try to image it it will get destroyed after some time uh, and then is there a way to go up beyond this limitation so is, is the resolution of the fraction imaging based on the intensity on the beam or on the energy of the x-ray the, 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 so the second question the, the, in the previous slide right, you were saying what dose is required for for example 10 nanometer uh, I think it, have enough. Dose, it sounds like how much energy do you need to deliver? Yes, right. we we have enough uh, photons, uh, but you, uh, the limitation is radiation damage. The sample, especially small features like a um, macromolecule, is damaged uh, quickly, and so uh, in order to achieve about 10 nanometer resolution, uh, you need something of the order the dose on the sample is equivalent of being a meter away from the Hiroshima bomb so yes so you need to protect the sample with the you freeze the sample so that it doesn't fall apart so there was one more question I didn't know if you were going to get into this but the issue about water uh, something that you like if you have water in your sample do you image through that? Does the X-ray pass through that? Or yes, there is a contrast between. Water? Yes, you image through a uh, water, not a thick layer, a thin layer of water. Uh, it, there is a window between the carbonates and the oxygen edge uh, that allows you to give uh, a high contrast. Uh, so why uh, do we do this? Um, so first of all. Um, the reason why we, we put the detector far away well, if you put the detector right after the sample what you get is an x-ray image like if you, when you go to the doctor uh, they do a chest x-ray or they look at your hands uh, this was the first x-ray image done by uh, Um so when you put the detector right after the sample you just measure the absorption of the sample uh, the problem is that this doesn't give you any magnification. So if you have if you had a detector that is capable of atomic resolution, then you're good. But since detectors are not uh, at atomic resolution, a typical CCD has only something like 10 micron pixel size. You need to create some form of mag magnification of your uh, information. So in our case, you let you let the light propagate long enough so that it covers the entire detector. Uh, the problem now is how to go back, how to propagate the light back to the sample uh, in order to get an image. Um, but what, what, so what happens by going between here and here is that the, uh, the image that you get right after uh, is fully transformed in the detector. You are in the full, it's called Fourier, uh, measurement, far field measurement. Uh, so, <coughs> to summarize, uh, what we want to do is, uh, instead of having a lens uh, to create a, a magnified version of your image, 
uh, we just put a detector far away, collect the diffraction pattern, and recover um, recover the object by propagating. Essentially, the computer propagates the light back to the sample. Um, so the problem now is how you propagate light without having the phase information. Uh, the phase information is uh, very important because it, it tells you the direction of propagation of light. So if you have a plane wave, the direction of propagation is perpendicular to the, uh, to the wave. Uh, if you have a curved wave, uh, each point is, uh, the direction of propagation of each section is perpendicular to the uh, wave, and so you can focus uh, your object. Um, so in order to propagate light, you need to have the phase information. Uh, the phase retriever is the uh, attempt to recover the, this phase information from diffraction data. One of the first examples is when uh, the DNA of a successful reconstruction like this is the uh, uh, structure of the DNA, which was solved by Watson and Crick after they looked at the diffraction data at the scattering pattern generated by DNA uh, and collected by Rosen and um, what we uh, what you try to do is you, you, you generate a model you calculate the Fourier transform and you see if uh, it matches with the data uh, if it doesn't match you try again uh, and you keep repeating it uh, in this case there is a small number of a small amount of information, only a few uh, dark spots in the image, so the, uh, the computation wasn't very difficult and you could do it by hand uh, as they did a long time ago. But now we have big computers and we do things uh, more uh, with the advanced computational methods. But just to give you some examples, uh, what happens, uh, this is on the top side uh, there are some objects uh, and on the bottom size is what the diffraction pattern will look like uh, if you were to illuminate this object with uh, a coherent beam. So what you have is if, you have, if your object is small in one direction and large in the other direction uh, in Fourier uh, space, in the measurement space which is also called uh, reciprocal space uh, all the dimensions are inverted so a small section uh, in the vertical direction becomes a large line in the uh, a long line in the vertical direction and something large in the horizontal becomes thin in the vertical in the horizontal uh, some symmetries are preserved for example if you have a circular symmetry uh, this is preserved uh, if you have a, a triangular symmetry you get actually the symmetry doubles you get uh, something that is has the same symmetry as this object plus its <coughs> central symmetry. Uh, and then uh, this is the classical uh, slit two uh, pinhole interferometer or Young's interferometer. So if you have just two bright points and you fully transform those, you get a fringe pattern like this, an interferometric pattern like this. So depending, if you look at these things, uh, you train your uh, self after a while to, be, to get uh, try to recover what the object uh, looked like. Uh, now, the com uh, all this inf type of information is used uh, by computational methods to uh, do this more or less automatically. Uh, one of the reasons why we like uh, these type of techniques with, uh, that use X-rays is that, first of all, there is a large number of X-rays. Uh, in the past uh, 20 or so years, there has been a big development in the uh, light sources for X-rays. Uh, so you can see that within, uh, let's say, 30 years, there has been an increase of uh, 15 orders of magnitude in the intensity of X-rays. Uh, and also, and the next year there will be another uh, 10 to the 10. So up here. Uh, in, in the peak brightness of X-ray sources. So there are a lot of X-ray sources uh, to use uh, and there is a lot of 
uh, proteins, structures, and biological cells, and a large number of materials that we would like to image, including, for example, uh, particles that come from the stardust, uh, from the sky, um, uh, particles that are collected in space, uh, they want to image them, uh, also synchrotrons, among many other uh, kinds of applications. But biology is probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, just to show you the number of uh, crystal structures that have been solved, uh, this is also growing very fast, and this is thanks uh, in part by the fact that there is more and more uh, X-rays available, more and more uh, powerful X-rays. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, a very small number of these crystals that have been solved are protein, uh, membrane protein. Uh, uh, structures. So there's always need for developing better techniques that uh, can give you an image from different types of uh, samples. In particular, proteins that cannot be crystallized. Uh, just to show you some uh, examples of uh, the success in the reconstruction methods. Um, this is the years. As time goes by, uh, people have been able to reconstruct from uh, uh, diffraction patterns alone uh, the uh, structures of a lot of proteins. Uh, first, the simple molecules like uh, salt, and then all the way up to the ribosome a few years ago. Uh, what we are doing it is also trying to image an entire cell uh, by these techniques, but the cell cannot be repeated. It cannot be replicated like in a crystal where you have the same protein replicated many times. So you can only collect uh, a certain number of uh, amount of x-rays before you destroy your cell. And this was one of the first examples of a reconstructed cell uh, just based on the uh, diffraction pattern. You can see some contrast here uh, of the inside the cell. Uh, this is just a repeat. Uh, so we, we do this operation of trying to guess what the sample is and make it match to the uh, data. By repeating, we first um, to, uh, constrain the, our sample to certain possible solutions. For example, we know that the sample uh, is finite any object on Earth is finite, uh, has two properties. First, it's finite, it uh, doesn't extend to infinity, and second, it's made of atoms. And you use these two information uh, on, on, in your iterations uh, to recover the object. So you impose your object to satisfy this type of condition that is finite, and uh, it also has to match the uh, diffraction pattern that you measured. So if you simulate the experiment, it has to match the uh, measurement. Um, so you have these two types of information. You, have, uh, you know that the object has a certain uh, overall shape. It's finite and it's bound within a certain region. And you know that the diffraction intensity is measured. Um, so what you do is you impose the two information alter, uh, alternating uh, the two types of information you start from a random phase uh, on the diffraction pattern and you uh, iterate first you say okay my object has a random phase then you fully transform the uh, diffraction pattern propagate it to the uh, real space uh, and the object should look like a cell for example uh, but uh, in reality, it comes out as a complete noise. So you impose it to be zero outside this pre, uh, area, and then uh, you propagate again in, in the measurement space, in Fourier space, and you impose it to have a, the given measured intensity, and you alternate the two uh, constraints, and eventually reach the solution. Uh, let me skip how you actually do this. It's too much math. 
but this is an example of what uh, the experiments that we have been we have been doing at the advanced light source. So what we have is a coherent X-ray beam coming from a synchrotron accelerator. You have a pinhole that selects the uh, coherent beam, and then the sample is mounted on a stick that can rotate and we collect the diffraction pattern over many orientations. Um, we developed the method to recover the object from many diffraction patterns. Uh, this is an example of a test object that we fabricated. Uh, this is a pyramid uh, as seen from the top uh, where you have, we put uh, a bunch of gold balls on the surface of this pyramid. Uh, you can see it rotate around uh, and then we record the many diffraction patterns and many orientations and we fill a volume uh, data space like, that looks like this uh, the diffraction patterns look like this and many orientations uh, and then you iterate between the measured diffraction patterns and the object space and you try to re recover it which we have done successfully a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, also, we have done similar things on aerogels that are of interest to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And uh, in collaboration with uh, Stony Brook, we are developing the same technique for cell biology. Here, the main problem is to put the sample inside the beam, inside vacuum, uh, with the cryogenic, at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, so we are working on that with the Stonerbrook team. Uh, the aim here is to achieve something of the order of 10 nanometer resolution. Um, this is another, this is an example of an air gel structure recovered uh, this way. Um, okay, so now uh, so, uh, the distinction between crystallography and diffractive imaging. In our case, we have a sample that is isolated, it's finite, and uh, we collect the diffraction pattern. Uh, then, uh, if you fully transform the measured diffraction pattern, you get a structure that looks like that. This is related to the original structure by an autocorrelation function. Uh, you, you obtain this structure if you just fully transform the, the diffraction pattern without applying uh, the phase information. Once you apply the phase information, you get an image of the original object. Um, the problem is with crystallography, uh, you can only collect a certain number of discrete points in the diffraction pattern. Uh, you can only recover, uh, record diffraction path, uh, the breakpoints of the diffraction pattern, uh, which means that this limits the amount of information that you can uh, record, uh, so it makes the phase retrieval problem more complicated. Uh, in particular, uh, if this is the structure that you, the autocorrelation function of the original object that you recorded, uh, you would like to recover, uh, record the entire autocorrelation function. And the problem of phase retrieval is to go from here back to here. Uh, or from going from here to here or from here to here is the, uh, the same is the com same computational problem uh, but if you start to reduce the amount of sampling that you collect uh, in a diffraction pattern uh, then what happens is that you get aliasing of the measurement and so what happens is if you look here you can see what happens as you reduce the sampling uh, you get the unit cell that uh, first is surrounded by empty space, so it satisfies the condition that uh, you have a support and you can iterate back and forth that way. Uh, and it starts to overlap after, as you go to the break condition, to the crystallographic measurement condition, uh, where you can only measure a limited number of points. Okay, more on the autocorrelation. The, the way you calculate the autocorrelation for a given object, this is an object that looks like a Y, uh, is that you, you move the object around and you integrate the overlapping regions uh, for each uh, translation between the object and its own copy. 
uh, a copy of itself. Uh, so here is, you can see how the uh, autocorrelation is being calculated. Uh, you, you translate the object back and forth and integrate over the, the you multiply the two regions and uh, obtain this information. Now how you go back from here to here, that's the phase retrieval problem. Uh, you can do tricks to make it easier, uh, to make the phase material problem easier. Uh, for example, you can put a point in near the object. And when you collect, when you measure the diffraction pattern uh, that you transform into an autocorrelation function by a simple uh, Fourier transform, you get the autocorrelation of the object. If the object contains a point here, uh, the autocorrelation will have a correlation between the point and the object that you are trying to use. Uh, so, what you see here in the autocorrelation function, simply by putting a, sim a simple point on the uh, membrane, is a is a uh, hologram of the object, uh, an, uh, an exact copy of the object that is what we call hologram. This particular type of measurement is called Fourier transform holography. Uh, so, what you do here is a test. Uh, we like to use test objects uh, rather than biological cells because they, they are difficult to manipulate. So, this is a test object. It's a, a micro the shell uh, of a microorganism uh, made of calcium carbonate. So it has high contrast. Uh, and now you put a little dot with a, uh, deposit a little dot with a focus ion beam. And uh, once you record the diffraction pattern and put it transform that, immediately you get uh, an image of the of original object. You can see that the contrast is just, uh, somewhat different because uh, this image was obtained with a scanning electron microscope. They can only see the surface of the object, but you can see here that there is some uh, little bit of structure in the inside of the uh, uh, object. Now, the problem with the holography, if the, this was, uh, this sounds like a solution to all our problems. If we don't have to do any phase retrieval, which is quite complex, uh, it gives you directly an image. But the problem is that. Um, the, if you have a small point, uh, it will, it's going to give you uh, low resolution. If you have a big point, uh, if you have a small point, it will give you high resolution. But if you, uh, but it will also give you a very weak signal. A weak point, a weak scattering point generates a weak ref, uh, scattering wave uh, that gives you a very weak hologram. Uh, if you make uh, the reference wave bigger, you lose the resolution, but you gain in brightness. So there is a, a trade-off between brightness of your image and resolution of your image in the holography. Uh, so what you can do uh, two things. Uh, what, you can, what you can do is to use multiple points. If you use two points uh, next to your object, you have an unknown object, this is a simple simulation. Uh, take an unknown object, which is a picture uh, used uh, often in signal processing, and you take two reference points. Now, the hologram, instead of being a simple image of your object with a weak signal to noise, it would be the superposition of the uh, two images of the object displaced from one another. Now, what you have is you have the top of the information, the bottom of the information, and the overlap. And so you can use this extra part of information to get a little bit uh, brighter uh, image. Now you can extend this to more than just two points. Uh, just to, if you just use two points, the improvement in uh, signal to noise is going to be only a uh, factor of two. But if you want to re have a real improvement by of orders of magnitude, factor of 10, 100, then you, there, is, there are other techniques. There is a, a coded aperture imaging. It's a method used in um, 
uh, astronomy uh, where you generate a special type of array whose cross correlation is a point uh, function. Uh, it has many applications. And in particular, you can use it in, um, uh, to improve the brightness of X-ray hologram. So instead, of, now you have a, a test object. Uh, in this case, it's the Vitruvian Man of Da Vinci. Uh, and instead of having a single point as a reference, uh, you put this special array that has these special properties um, and collect the diffraction pattern. Now you do a Fourier transform, and instead of having a standard hologram, uh, like you did before, where you get an image of the um, object, uh, you have a scrambled image of the object. So you need a an extra step to get the final image, but you improve the brightness of the final image by uh, several orders of magnitude, which means that you can collect this uh, same amount of information with less dose on your sample. Uh, you can do it faster, better. Uh, but again, in this case, even in this case, this uh, you still have to fabricate an object yeah. at very high resolution. So how, how big is this object? It must be very, very small. Uh, this is two micron. So then your reference object is also two micron. Yes. The problem again is that if you try to achieve atomic resolution, you have to make, create an array with atomic resolution. How do you do that? Uh, this was done by electron beam lithography. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but you're never you're not going to get to atomic resolution with this one. But it's it's good because it gives you an initial image of the object, and then you can improve by doing phase of three well, in principle. So, now I've shown you the uh, fact that you can do things without lenses. Now let's see what the uh, resolution uh, limitations are. So the first thing to do, the first limit, uh, if you plot uh, the amount of those that you need for a given resolution, uh, it goes like, it goes up with a smaller pixel size. So if you have a given object, the, you want to image it a high resolution, you need roughly the same number of photons for you every pixel. And so, um, if you want to image uh, 100 by 100 pixels, you need a uh, certain number of photons. If you want to increase the number of pixels, you need more photons. Uh, so as you uh, increase the resolution, you have, uh, you have to illuminate the smaller part of the object. Uh, and so the signal to noise, the, the, the dose goes up uh, if you want higher weight. Uh, yes, higher resolution is this way, sorry. Uh, so the dose goes up with a higher resolution. Uh, so you have to be above this line in order to be able to image your sample. Otherwise, you just recover noise. Um, then you have to be below a certain destroying dose. Uh, as you keep shining X-rays onto your sample, you're going to destroy it. And the smaller the feature in your sample, the easier it is to destroy. So, uh, so the, do the the limit of uh, destroying uh, a particular size uh, of the sample uh, goes down uh, with the resolution. So you have to be below this line and above this line, which means uh, you're, you're limited in this triangle. Uh, this triangle, uh, so if you go to the limit, that's about 10 nanometer uh, resolution. Uh, also, this depends on how, how well you fit these points. It's not very clear that this line is if you take the line a little bit, you could go to five nanometer. It's not. Uh, this is uh, the line has been uh, fitted on experimental values, but uh, this region is not very well known, so it's not exactly clear uh, that this is the actual limit. It could be a factor of five plus or minus. But one way to overcome this limitation 
is to uh, do it fast. So if you have an x-ray that goes to the sample very fast, uh, the sample, even if it's destroyed by the x-ray beam, x-ray, the x-ray pulse has gone through the sample, you collect an image, uh, and you do it. Uh, so the image is a frozen uh, image of your sample before it's blown up. So that's the goal. Um, you have a, a single protein, a stream of proteins, you inject them into the beam, then you have a very powerful X-ray. Uh, X-ray. Uh, that is 10 orders of magnitude brighter than current uh, synchrotrons. And it will be available starting next year. Uh, so you have a very bright X-ray pulse that goes through the protein and scatters, and then you do the same uh, phase retrieval operation to recover the object. Problem is, if you just have a single to the uh, single shot, you get a two-dimensional view. And what we want is three-dimensional information. So you have a stream of identical proteins in the, they go through the beam, and you collect many diffraction patterns, and then you compare all the diffraction patterns. From the diffraction pattern, you can determine the orientation of each individual protein that you have in the beam. Uh, then you do the phase retrieval, so there's a a, l- a slightly larger computational problem because you also have to find the orientation of each individual diffraction pattern. But you do all these computational problems and you eventually uh, recover uh, the structure. How long would it take to recopy it then? If you have 10 to the 7 measurement? Uh, yeah, that's an I issue. Mean, that's there are, there is an, so this is a, like a grand challenge. Okay. A lot of people are trying to work out various solutions. So one is how do you generate an X-ray pulse that is 10 femtosecond long? How do you generate a stream of particles and focus them and make them collide into the same region? And you want the particles to be identical uh, with a thin water jacket so that they don't get uh, um, they don't change conformation with the native state. Uh, and then you need a fast detector that can collect uh, thousands of diffraction patterns. Uh, and then finally, the computational problem is quite challenging. Uh, there was a recent there was a recent paper just published in Nature Physics where they they sidestep this part of the calculation and they show that uh, you can do this uh, if you can do this uh, without. Uh, doing part of the calculation, uh, you can imp- improve the signal to noise uh, and require less measurements or less photons in the diffraction pattern. Uh, so it's an active field of development. Uh, let me give you some basic of how you generate these X-ray sources. Uh, t- you have um, the way we get ec- uh, powerful these powerful X-rays is. Uh, by sending an electron beam, which is uh, accelerated in a particle uh, uh, accelerator uh, to relativistic energies, and you send it into an um, electromagnetic field. If you have an electron beam, an electron, and you change its, uh, its uh, you accelerate it in some direction, this is going to emit electromagnetic radiation. If you move it up and down, it's going to uh, it's like an antenna. You generate the radio frequency. Uh, but if the if the electron is going at relativistic energies, uh, what uh, in its own field it doesn't move very fast. But it, from your perspective, when you do the experiment, it, uh, the the electromagnetic field is uh, shifted to X-rays. Uh, this is called Doppler shift. It's like when an ambulance comes toward you, the pitch sounds uh, uh, higher frequency because it's coming toward you. In this case, the electron is going at uh, relativistic energy, uh, and so the radiation that it emits is transformed to X-rays. Uh, now, what you do with a free electron laser uh, is that you want this radiation that is now coming out uh, as a spontaneous emission from each individual electron in the storage ring, um, you want it to all come at the same time simultaneously with the same phase. And to do this, 
uh, you let you you take a you take a, a lot of uh, electron electrons in the beam. You pack them together and send them into the same uh, type of uh, um, magnetic field where it uh, forms a, a trajectory and emits X-rays. But now, since you have a lot, uh, you're going to have a lot of light that travels together with the uh, um, electrons. And these two uh, interact with each other and the uh, light, at some point, stimulate the emission of uh, the electrons inside this magnetic field and so it becomes uh, stimulated emission and uh, you gain 10 orders of, 10 orders of magnitude in, intensi in peak intensity. Well, just to show you, this is where we are now, type of, we have uh, the peak brightness, uh, which is a measure of how many photons of, uh, important, of a given important qualities that is uh, spectral bandwidth and thing, uh, area and collimation, things like that. This is how much we have right now, and this is how much we will have uh, in about a year. Uh, so there is a jump, a big jump, uh, but so far we haven't been able to use this because it's not available yet, but there is a, something that was available in the past couple of years. It's uh, a short, uh, lower wavelength, um, how long? Yeah. Well, how long is my talk? Until you have until three o'clock. But um, however, however much material you have. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Thanks. That clock's wrong. Though, back there, so you know. Huh? That clock's wrong. Just say now. Oh no no! no I, I put a battery in there. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's finally all right. Okay. Well, you, you can stop me if you have questions. But. Uh, so, uh, there is a big jump in the number of uh, available photons um, that would happen soon. And there is some uh, light source already available, which is at the wrong wavelength. It's a, a wavelength that is sufficient to achieve uh, some 10 nanometer resolution, not yet uh, atomic resolution. But you can do tests uh, with this type of source. For example, you can test the idea that you can image things before they blow up or you can test uh, other high intensity actually being sample interaction. The, the accelerator, this accelerator that will be operational uh, in a bit is um, at Stanford, Stanford Linear Collider. Uh, it's, uh, about the accelerator itself is about one mile long, uh, but they are using only part of it. Uh, so you have this uh, accelerator that creates relativistic electrons, they go through uh, um, magnetic fields and emit X-rays. Uh, what is available now is only 100 meters or so long. You can see the building here. Ele uh, electrons are generated from here. And now I'll show you what uh, this building how it looks like. This is a picture of the inside the building. There are all these, uh, there is a X-ray beam that comes out of one of these pipes. They put a mirror to deflect the beam onto one of the pipes, and then uh, you do your experiment at the end. Uh, so, for example, we were working on this beam line. So all our equipment is was here, lots of computers, and you put together your uh, experiment. Uh, run your experiment for a couple of weeks, then pack it up and go home. And do it again next year. Um, our particular experiment uh, was fairly uh, compact because we had to fit inside <coughs> inside then other, someone else's chamber. So uh, experiment is some, uh, something like this thing. Essentially it consists of uh, a sample mounting system uh, and a a mirror and the CCD detector to collect the diffraction pattern. Um, so we have um, uh, our first experiment consisted in just showing that we could measure things uh, so fast that even if they blow up, our image was a frozen uh, picture of the object before this happened. Uh, so our object was. Uh, something that looks like this, two little guys with the sun, 
uh, we also use the other um, uh, objects, uh, gratings and uh, various types of test patterns. Uh, so the experiment is fairly simple con conceptually. You have an exo beam that is the sample. There's a mirror, a uh, special mirror made especially for x-rays uh, that reflects the light scattered off onto a detector uh, and this avoids the problem of uh, the, the, the mirror has a hole so that you don't blow up the mirror. These are very powerful x-rays. If, if we were to put the detector there, it would just blow, uh, create a hole in the detector and then it wouldn't work. So that's why we did it. And you can see here uh, an example of this particular test object. Uh, we used a wavelength of uh, uh, 32 nanometers, so it's not enough to give you a resolution uh, of the order of atomic resolution to, uh, yet, but it's a proof of principle of the fact that you can image things before they go up. So this is the diffraction pattern that we collected in a, in a single shot. Uh, the X-ray pass is uh, 15 femtoseconds long. Uh, if, you, if you want uh, some uh, comparison of timing, uh, 0 0.1 femtosecond is the time an electron travels around uh, the hydrogen atom in a, in a classical uh, atom model. Uh, chemical react electronic reactions happen in uh, uh, tens of femtoseconds, chemical reactions in uh, hundreds of femtoseconds mm -hmm. to picoseconds. Uh, so this is a really frozen image of how the object uh, look like. Even if the resolution is not enough to see uh, that you've frozen all the vibrations, anything that was ha happening in the sample. Uh, the second shot, we collected the diffraction pattern from the same sample a second time, and it looks like this, very different from the original one, uh, which shows that the sample was completely destroyed. The reconstructed image here shows, compares well with the um, image obtained with the scanning electron microscope. Uh, so far, uh, when we do these test experiments, or uh, we prove uh, new types of experiments, we always use a sample that we already know how it looks like to see if we can recover it. Well, what's the sample made of? It's a thin membrane of silicon nitride, uh, and we drill the holes with a focused ion beam. It's just a test pattern, and this is one micro. Um, so after, the, after two shots, the sample looks like this. This is this, um, a window, and here normally there is a silicon nitride. And before we, around here, we asked the, um, a structure like this. And after two shots on the sample, the whole membrane is vaporized. This is going to happen. The sample heats up to about uh, 60,000 degrees. Got it. Uh, generates plasma so the sample is completely vaporized uh, this would happen also to proteins uh, but if you have many you can still do the experiment um, but an several ways of estimating the resolution tells us that uh, looking at the small features in between uh, the object tells us that we achieve the resolution uh, that is as good as it can get with a detector of this type and the wavelength of this type. So we achieved all the uh, limits that uh, we could get with this type of uh, experiment. In particular, we, show, we have shown that uh, we can um, image things before they get damaged. Uh, another problem is how do you inject uh, particles into the beam. If you want to do a single proteins, you cannot put them on a membrane like we did before, but you have to inject them in vacuum in the beam. And then another problem is how fast does the X-ray uh, pass need to be in order to achieve uh, atomic resolution. 
because if you have a long pulse, the sample starts to blow up as you try to image it, and you, you no longer get atomic resolution. So that X-rays had to be very short and very powerful to give you a single shot image. Uh, and then uh, another thing will be that another thing that we like to do when we, a little more, a little more they particularly like to blow things up. So we studied the dynamics of the. Uh, um, things that are uh, under intense X-ray pulses. Uh, I probably skip this part because it's not really relevant to biology. So our challenge was: How do you inject uh, an electron beam, uh, a particle beam, inside uh, a vacuum and collide the X-ray beam with a uh, particle beam? Uh, so there are techniques that exist already. Uh, first, you need to create aerosolize your uh, part, uh, proteins. Uh, in our case, again, the wavelength was not uh, good enough for doing this experiment. Uh, so we, went, we didn't try to do it on proteins, but we used test samples like uh, uh, latex spheres or sugar uh, balls or things. Things that are bigger than single proteins. Uh, so first of all, you uh, create an uh, electrospray. So you have a, a nozzle where you sp spray out uh, some liquid containing the material that you want to study, uh, and then you generate a potential, uh, solar potential, the, and the uh, jet that comes out uh, is highly charged, uh, so the uh, the part, the liquid try, tries to, since it has a lot of charge, it tries to uh, go apart from uh, itself. Uh, it's a repulsive force because it's charged. Uh, so the, the, uh, it, the liquid starts to break up and form a lot of little drops. This is what, how the electrospray works. Uh, so now you have a lot of little drops uh, of liquid and uh, we want to inject these drops into the beam. So what we do was developed uh, by Mike Bogan and others at Livermore um, is this uh, s system of uh, um, essentially it's a, a series of concentric holes with different pressure levels between them that d creates a flow of air uh, that it gets sucked in into vacuum uh, starting from atmospheric pressure, where you have this original uh, uh, spray, uh, spray uh, stuff of containing potentially molecules. Uh, this series of uh, concentric light uh, holes, what they do is uh, they suck. This is the, a slide uh, view of that. Um, device that I show. Uh, so you have these holes, one after the other, and air being sucked into vacuum. And as it goes through smaller and smaller holes, it accelerates and generates a smaller um, and smaller beam of particles. So now you have a fairly collimated beam of uh, proteins or uh, different types of particles, and uh, you shoot it into the X-ray beam and collected the uh, diffraction pattern. Uh, another thing that we could do is uh, use uh, a differential mobility analyzer, which is essentially uh, just a tube with an electric uh, field that uh, accelerates these particles, these drops inside uh, the tube. Uh, and uh, but there is a drag due to the pressure, the fact that there is some air in the cylinder, and so the big, if there is a big <coughs> drop, uh, this will go slower than if the drop is smaller. So you can select size, you can select the size of the uh, thing you want to measure by using a device like that. So we have a, uh, first an electrospray, then uh, th this device that selects. Um, uh, the size of the particles that we want to image, and then a stack of concentric holes uh, to inject these uh, particles into the X-ray beam. Now we brought this to 
the free electron laser, and you have uh, serial particles, extra beam, and uh, so you have uh, an injection system with a stream of particles that are injected into the X-ray, into the vacuum. You have the free electron laser that it comes this way. The same uh, uh, acquisition system that we had before, uh, where you have uh, a mirror instead of a, or a detector being uh, looking directly on the diffraction pattern, we put a mirror that reflects the diffraction pattern. And then there are several types of diagnostic. One is a time of flight mass spectrometer. It essentially looks at the fragments that are generated into... It's a mass spectrometer that looks at the um, gas inside the chamber. And when you heat a, prot uh, a particle with a free electron laser, this blows up and creates a lot of uh, particles around. And if, you, if you measure... Uh, what kind of uh, elements were in the particles, you can determine whether it was a piece of dirt or it was uh, uh, the thing that you actually wanted to study. And then uh, detector again. Also there is a Faraday cap that essentially just measures, uh, you have a, a charged uh, particle, a stream of charged particles that is going this way, and uh, if it enters uh, a piece of metal it creates a charge on the piece of metal uh, it creates a mirror charge on the piece of metal and you can measure that to determine whether uh, there was a particle that went through or not so we have all these diagnostic tools everything is very compact like this big and uh, brought it to the free electron laser and shot uh, several particles and you can see this in particular case these were uh, sugar balls uh, mixed uh, sugar uh, and other things uh, and this is the diffraction pattern that was collected from a single uh, particle of about 50 nanometers now if you could scale this to um, single proteins then essentially this uh, this is one of the last steps of uh, doing the experiment the final one is uh, probably analyzing the data but also making sure that the proteins that are injected are always the same and purified is it actually difficult to overlap the beam? yes uh, also yeah one problem is uh, here we use a lot of uh, uh, X-ray pulses, a high repetition, and uh, the detector c cannot read out as fast. So uh, this measurement contains one particle that has been hit, and probably a, a thousand X-ray pulses that went through without hitting anything. So it's not very efficient yet. Uh, We would, uh, yeah, so we need to improve the efficiency essentially by uh, doing a better, uh, better ways of uh, manipulating these uh, protein beams. There, there are not many people that try to put proteins in vacuum, create pro protein beams. Uh, but at some point we did achieve a fairly high heat rate. Uh, here, for example, there is uh, at two particles at the same time into the X-ray beam. Uh, you can see the fringe pattern that looks like the two, the diffraction pattern from two dots that I showed uh, in the beginning. Then we started uh, spraying all sorts of things inside this uh, uh, device. Uh, this was uh, a, uh, some kind of biological cell that uh, we, well, from, from the wavelength that we got, uh, the image that you can see is essentially only the outline of the uh, cell. The reason why these two look alike is just because uh, they chose the, uh, grace, the color map to be similar. But this essentially, you just get the outline of the uh, cell so far with this wavelength. Um, Well, the, okay, so the last uh, part is how fast the 
How fast do you need to do the measurement before you, uh, so that we can achieve atomic resolution? Uh, so what happens if you have a, a, a protein? Uh, physicists like to approximate things as a ball. So uh, assume a protein is a ball. Now you start shooting X-rays into the uh, protein. This uh, creates electrons that are photonated. Uh, and so the particle, the ball starts to be charged. It create it emits a lot of photoelectrons, starts to be charged, and the atoms or the ions inside the ball starts to are uh, um, start to blow up from the molecule. First, the top layer. If you look a cross section, within about 10 femtoseconds or 20 femtoseconds, uh, the molecule starts to blow up. Um, so the measurement should be about this long. Uh, now, if you can put a, a layer of water that blows up and it doesn't really matter to your imaging, uh, that would be good. It could, if you put, if you make it long, big enough, it could extend your time, the time uh, with, that you can use to to, to image the uh, protein. Uh, but it has to be extremely short, something of the order of. Uh, 20 to 40 uh, femtoseconds. Right now, the free electron laser uh, specifications is about a factor of 10 uh, too long, or about a factor of 5 too long. So it's not clear that we can do it, uh, this thing uh, at atomic resolution uh, as soon as uh, the beam turns on. It would take several years. So then we did... We st Last thing, very quickly, we studied how this thing blows up by sending the X-ray on the particle, reflecting the X-ray beam on a mirror that blows up. The particle blows up, mirror blows up, but ha both have time to. The particle has time to diffract, and the mirror has time to reflect. And then the beam that is incident on the um, mirror is also reflected again, and it hits the, sun, the particle again. And so you have a, uh, an image of the uh, particle before it starts to blow up and after it starts to blow up. And so we use this to uh, try to figure out how fast uh, the particle explodes. But I'll just finish here. Thank you for your attention. Here are the people, a large number of people that uh, contributed to this work. And, uh, do you have any questions? Are you able to send this PowerPoint to Yeah. For, to review it? Yes. It's a lot of information. Look at it the second time. Huh? It yeah. says we could look at it a second time. Oh, yeah. It's a lot. Too, too much information. Okay. Well, it wasn't a kind of an overview, not really. Is it? Yeah. Very yeah. good. So how long do you think it's going to take before this is effective? Uh, long time. Ten years. Before you can... Well, atomic resolution. But we will start probably with the easier things like maybe nanocrystals that are too small for um, synchrotrons. Or... Uh, but I think, for example, one thing... Imaging cells at uh, very high resolution that should be feasible in a shorter time scale. Do you think it's going to be possible with living cells? Or is it no, they have to be frozen. Then if you want to see, uh, if you want to see macromolecules, or there are other methods in, with visible light microscopy, for example, you can. Uh, if you ex if you have a fluorescing uh, protein, then you can determine its location at a very high resolution, up to down to atomic resolution. Uh, but you can only see a few. If you want an overall picture, then you probably need x-rays. Will there be any, I'm a biologist, so I'm just thinking, will there be any locations for antibiotic drug design using this kind of technology to try to structure of the microbes to target them uh, well, more efficiently. Well, the biggest uh, problem for um, 
crystallography is membrane proteins and these only have nine uh, very small number like ten has been solved and these are a key to any drugs delivery system that's all I'm, I'm not a biologist <laughs> not so much about the antibiotic design but I know that uh, one of the researchers in Australia Leon Tilly had come with uh, red blood cells that contained the malaria parasite. And I thought that she was using the, the ALS to reduce the imaging there of, um, of the parasite inside the red cells. Do you know uh, about that? Uh, who is this? Yeah. I know someone did look at a malaria infected right. red blood cells yeah. with a, not with a free electron laser, but with a coherent diffractive imaging. The first thing that I showed there. Or try to image cells, and uh, I don't know why they did it. Yeah. There are two groups. There is one in uh, Switzerland, I think. Another maybe in Australia. Stefano, thank you very much for your time.